So last time we looked at these psukim from Yechezkel and the pasuk from Yeshayahu, and essentially what we got out of it is the following. <clears throat> um, Rav Yosef introduced the idea that this uh, that uh, maybe one is not allowed to go through water under any circumstances, not just because it's Yom Kippur, not allowed to go to wa into water that would be above your waist. And as proof, he brought these psukim from Yechezkel, and where Yechezkel is led by, in a vision, he is led by like a halach, who measures out lengths of a thousand amot at a time, and the first length are water that came up to his ankle, and the second length was water that came up to his knees, and the third length was water that came up to his waist. And then the fourth measure was a nacha, right? It's a, a, a wadi that he said, that I could not pass through. So Rav Yosef wanted to make a proof from that, that once water gets above uh, the waist, you're not allowed to go through it. So I didn't, I didn't, I was, I listened to the shir yesterday or this morning and I, I realized, look, the, the, uh, the pasuk, uh, this pasuk, Vayamad Elef Nachal Asher Lo Uchal So literally it means that he measured a thousand and it was a Nachal that I could not pass through. So, this term of uchal, um, if you take it, you know, if you take it in the simplest understanding, it just means that he wasn't physically able to pass through it. Like he could not pass through it. But it could be the Rav Yosef understands that to mean that he wasn't allowed. Colloquially, we use that. Uh, the term like lo yachol or ef shar, you know, we use terms like this when we some when we sometimes mean that it's halachically impermissible. So, I'm assuming that this is how Rav Yosef understood that pasuk, that lo uchal lavor meant I I couldn't pass through, meaning I wasn't allowed to pass through, which doesn't contradict the idea that he. He couldn't physically pass through. In other words, both of those things can be true. So Abaye said to him that the Nacha is different because it's uh, rushing water. And then the Drasha continues and says maybe he could have uh, passed through it by swimming or floating. But the Hemshech, the continuation of that pasuk says, Ki because the water became great. It was water of Sahu. And then it says, Nachal Asher Lo Ye Aver. The rest of that pasuk isn't in the Gemara, but that's the pasuk in the we saw. It was Me Sachal. Sahu a nachal asher lo yeaver is a nachal that could not be passed. So um, both of those things, right? So it's it was made. So the me sahu here would mean uh, the way the Gemara understands it is the me sahu is water, waters of swimming or floating. Um, that could not be passed. In other words, the only, the only, I guess would have, you could understand it, but Mesachu, that would be the only way that one could conceive of going through the water would be by floating, but they could not be passed. And um, then the Gemara continues, so maybe it means that you could get through it with a small boat. And then, they, then the Gemara quotes that Pasuk from uh, Yishayam, that uh, you could not go through it, a, a, a boat, a small boat could not 
go through it. So we discussed this last time that it was, it's a little unclear, it's a little strange because the Pasuk from Yishayel, it's not clear that it's talking about the same water that Yechezkel was talking about. But in the context, the way it's brought down in the Gemara, it's brought as if it's a continuation of the waters that Yechezkel is talking about. Uh, and it finishes off by saying maybe, right, so you couldn't pass through with a small boat, maybe with a large boat, but the Hemsheikh of Natasuk and Yishayahu says, but see a dear lo a great ship could not pass through it. So, as I said to you last time, I, I believe I understand what Rav Yosef is trying to say, what the Gemara is trying to say. And it, it is saying that this that waters the the waters that are described as coming out of the Beit and Mikdash uh ultimately I guess when they get to that fourth stage could become these unruly waters. So we saw that in um it's not clear why the water why water comes out of the Beit and Mikdash in Yechazkel. Uh, in Yeshayahu, we understood it to be altogether more of a metaphor that Hashem was going to uh, protect Jerusalem as, as if it was surrounded by great waters. So, again, I don't know enough to tell you exactly how this all works. We're going to talk about it a little bit more because there's also a reference to these waters in Zaharia, which the Gemara is going to bring up. But okay, in terms of the halachic aspect, um, every, so we should just mention, so Abaye had objected to Rav Yosef's objection. Rav Yosef wants to say based on the Psukim and Yechezkel, one shouldn't go through water at any time that's above their waist. And the Bayes says, no, that it's only really applicable um, with a Nachal, which would be running water, like rushing water, which we're very familiar with in Israel. You know, you've got the seasonal Nachal, and we know that they can be rushing waters and very, very dangerous. And that's how Abai understands the Psukim. So in terms of the Halakha, the Halakha would stand in place that on Yom Kippur or even not on Yom Kippur, you would be allowed to go through not rushing waters up to your neck. That would still stand in place. And the rest of the discussion in the Gemara about the water uh, seems to be there just to fill out the this midrashic understanding of the waters that are coming out of the temple and the waters that Yeshayahu describes as surrounding Jerusalem. Okay. Now we have a, you know, as a continuation of that. So this is the next part of the Gemara. Amar Yehuda ben Pazi, Af Malach Hamavet Ein Lo Rishud Lavor Betocha. Even the angel of death does not have permission to pass through it. So here it's written, that's the Pasuk in Yeshaya, that a uh, small boat or a boat with oars, or however you want to translate that, will not pass through it. Uh, so this is, of course, a Pasuk in Yehov, which just give me a moment, we'll bring it up. Yeah, so this is from the very beginning of the Yov. We can read the first few psukim, it's here in Pasuk Zion, right? 
איש היה בארץ עוץ איוב שמו, והיה האיש אל הותם וישר לירא אלוקים ושר מרע. So there was this fellow Eov in the land of Oz, the land of Uts, and he was a good person. And he had seven sons and three daughters. He had also quite a lot of property. Um, and his sons went and made a mishta party. They called their sisters to come and join them. So after their party, Eo went and offered sacrifices on their behalf. He was such a Yirei Elohim, and he was so concerned, he thought maybe this long party that was going on, maybe they sinned, maybe my children sinned, and maybe they said something that would have been uh, heretical. So he gave a uh, korbanot on their behalf, and this is how he have conducted himself all of, all of his days. So then we get to the interesting part of the plot. So there was a day that the literally the sons of God, uh, presumably these are Malachim, they come to stand before God and the Satan comes among them. Uh, so Satan, not necessarily the way Christians understand it, but Satan means, you know, an antagonist. So one of them is an antagonist. So Hashem says to Satan, from where did you come? I came from Shut Ba'aretz. So this is what we um, talked about a little bit last time in the Gemara also. This word lashut would mean, like in this context, it seems to mean that he was that he came from roaming around the land or wandering around the land. Uh, in the context that we have it, just a moment ago in the Gemara, it's supposed to mean swimming or floating. Uh, so there's there is a kind of an overlap here in terms of of its meanings. But, you know, it could mean all of these things, right? So here in the BDB, they say it means to go or rove about. And uh, just a second. The Radak. Just a moment. Um, he... Right, he he puts it together with these other psukim, shot shinlav tzitet, like shatu ha'am v'laktu. Right, that when people went to uh, gather up uh, the sod, they roamed about and picked it up. Or vayashutu b'chol ha'aretz, shut na, shut ba'aretz. He quotes the pasuk here, um, and he has other examples and different in different forms. And he says, um, he says, Inyanam kinyan the, the meanings of these words are, it, it's like the word bayatu, like when the Miraglim go to look in the land, it, it says bayatu. So he says, uh, like shoot is a very similar meaning. Um, yeah, and then he quotes later on, Anishayit, he quotes the Pasuk from uh, Anishaya, and here he says, what is Anishayit? Perush Aniyash Amalifim Oto It's a ship that you 
propel using oars. And that's where we get that translation. Yeah. Um, okay. So we don't have to go through all the different things here. It's, it, I just, I find it very interesting. But um, back for a moment to the Gemara. So what is the, what is the Gemara trying to say? Um, Rabbi Yehuda ben Pazi, when he's, he's, you know, now that we're talking about this water, right, at the, fi at, at the final stage, the way it's described in the Shayao, that even a great ship can't pass through it, so Rabbi Yehuda ben Pazi extends the drasha. He says, even the Malach Mavet, which is a reference to the Satan in Yov, could not pass. He doesn't have permission to pass through it. Yeah. And his proof is uh, because here it says, Balte Lech Anishayit, Uktiv Hatam Mishut Ba'aretz. So I think the way you have to understand this is so, what does it mean, Mishut Ba'aretz? The way we understood the Pshat in uh, in a yov, second. Uh, the way we understood the shot in a yov, what did he say? By Omar Mishut Baaretz, he's coming back from roaming the land. Um, and from, uh, you know, going through it, right? From going back and forth in the earth, back and forth, okay, the shoot. And from walking up and down. And, okay. I mean, those are reasonable. Uh, those are reasonable things. But what's the point? In the Pshat of the Pasuk, he did, who came shot, like he did do this wandering or this roaming. He did the roaming. So what's the proof from the Pasuk that, he, that he's not allowed to go through the water? It, it, most specific, it specifically says Ba'aretz. Oh, actually, I didn't think of that. Very good. <laughs> so that's, a, that's uh, right. So he came back. Okay, so so let's take that for a second. So if, if we understand what you're saying, that he came back from wandering in the land, but he, he was only wandering in land and he wasn't wandering in water. That could be, but where's the implication that he wasn't allowed to go through water? Yeah, because he didn't. Um, yeah, I don't see otherwise. Right. So it's not it's not a hundred percent it's not a hundred percent clear from that. Um, just a second. Yeah, okay, we're back here. Um, and I, also here, I didn't uh, actually, uh, to be honest, I had a little less time this week and I didn't delve into this as much as I wanted, but I, I think that the other way of understanding this pasuk, if, if this is the drashad, if you take the words mishut ba'aretz out of context a little, so mishut, in other words, if the, the mem at the beginning could indicate not, uh, like, you know, that he refrained from. Oh, oh, oh for, yeah, okay. Mishut bards, instead of, because it could have said lashut bards, like I went. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the drasha. Okay. I think that's the drasha. Um, but, okay, so let's leave that as is. So, bonagid, that's the drasha. Uh, but so now we have another question. Like also, like mazikashur. Like yeah. so, <laughs> so what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, well, if it's Satan can't do it, then certainly a uh, human can't do it. Maybe that's the uh, implication. Yeah, I think it has to do with this. I think there is an implication here. So remember, all right, and also 
so in other words, he's trying to make a kind of Shava because it says Balte Lochva Ani Shait, right? So the emphasis on the word Shait, and that the uh, Satan could not be, you know, Mishut Ba'aretz. He couldn't travel through through it in the land. And what, again, also, it's a little unclear, even according to what I'm saying. Where's the indication that he couldn't go through water? But maybe it's that maybe it's both what I'm saying and what you're saying, right? And it was that it says ba'aretz, but not ba'mayim, and he was unable to pass through. I, I'm not sure. I I I I don't have a really clear. I don't have a really clear understanding of this. We can take a second and look. I didn't look at. Um, I don't know if. Uh, Steinsaltz is going to illuminate this anymore. We could take a look. Let's see. I have a couple of places I could look. I'm, I apologize. I was a little preoccupied with some things, which is not a good excuse, but that's that's the way it is. Um, yeah, let's see what is. Steins uh, he can't go through it beyond the boundaries of this river. Because here it says, right? The Satan, even the Satan in the land, cannot go through this, um, through this river. So that's unfortunate. In other words, that's the plain understanding of the words, but it's not very illuminating. Yeah. Uh, with all with all respect to Rav Steinsatz, but I know I'm not blaming him. He his whole shita in explaining the Gemara was not necessarily to say more than what the simple reading was. That was really what he was trying to do. Uh, I saw, a, back in the 90s, I saw a, uh, an interview with him in Haaretz, and, that, and that's what he said, that the whole point of his Perush was to give the first reading to, to people, but it wasn't to learn the Gemara for them. Yeah. Uh, so I think that was uh, that was a great thing. But it just occurred to me since we're here, and if you don't mind, yeah, I have this other perush um, in Barilan. Let me make sure you can see. Yeah, <clears throat> called Chavruta. I don't know if you're familiar with this. No. I've seen it in. Print like it's uh, it's it's one of the more recent. I don't know. I'm not sure when it was first published, but sometime in the last ten years, I think uh, it's a kind of a yeshivish reply to Steinsaltz, as it were. It's and it, it it's it, it's it's actually very good. It's also a very limited perush. Um, sometimes it has very Good footnotes. It's also just to give it. It gives a very simple, straightforward reading of the Gemara. Uh, but sometimes they add a little bit more. So, but he doesn't add that much more. <laughs> I see. He says, "Ktiv hatam b'malach hamavet shechazar mishut barts who came back from wandering the land." Yeah. It implies that this nachal that was impossible the shayet bo right even the malachamavid wasn't allowed to pass through. With all respect, it's still a little bit um, unclear to me, but um, maybe that's just me. But yes, we're still left with the question of, of what exactly does it add. So the only thing I the only thing I can think of though is this. So based on the way we understood this 
the use of this pasuk from Yeshayel last week, that it was the idea that Yushalayim would be surrounded by these turbulent waters as a kind of protection of Yushalayim. So it means that even the Malach HaMavet could not pass through them. That is, that Yushalayim would be so protected it would even be, be, be protected from the Satan, who is here portrayed as the Malach HaMavet. So that much I could say. Right? However, we understand the, the, the mechanics of the drasha. that seems to be what's, what's implied. And the implication is not immediately important for the halachic aspect, but for the metaphorical slash midrashic understanding of why the what what the purpose of these waters surrounding the shrine were, it adds an extra layer of, of oomph <laughs> of power to them. <clears throat> so continuing the Gemara now, Gemara is still talking about these waters, right? So now we're just going to digress and talk a little bit more about the nature of these waters. So it says, mishum Ravuna Tzipora. Rabbi Pinchas said in the name of Ravuna Tzipora, which I understand to mean that he came from Tzipori. Right? So Ravuna of Tzipori. Mayan mi beit ha-kadashin. The spring that came from the Holy of Holies, but in the beginning it was like the antenna of grasshoppers. Once they reached the opening of the Hechal, they uh, they became like the 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 string of, of uh, the sheti. Now, I always get these mixed up, right? So the shet, the, sh, the sheti, the shti, and the erev are the whoop and the warp, the the, the, oh, oh, the, the yeah. whoop and the warp of the uh, weft, the weft and the warp of the uh, of the loom, and um, the sheti is going to be thinner, and the uh, Arab, or, or, uh, the Arab is going to be thicker. So, so first they come out like the antenna of grasshoppers. So it's extremely thin. So, in the way, let's just also follow the way he's describing it. So, the, according to the way he understands it, the water is coming out from the. It begins from the Kodesh Kodeshim. So, it comes out the Kodesh Kodeshim, and now it's. Uh, moving to the opening of the Hechal, right? So it's going through the Kodesh until it gets to the opening of the Hechal. Once it goes to the, gets to the opening of the Hechal, then it starts to get thicker, and then it's like fruit of Sheti. Kevan Shigil Ulam, once it gets to the Ulam, um, it becomes like the Chut of uh, Arab, it becomes like the West. Um, and again, you have to pardon me because I actually looked this up again recently. I still forgot which one is the weft and which one is the warp, but it becomes the thicker one. Um, so that's a very short distance, right? In other words, so if you remember, right, the hechal is uh, is let's say forty amot from the from the end of the kodesh kodeshim, then the kodesh is forty amot. But between the opening of the Hechal and the opening of the, uh, until it gets to the Ulam, um, between the, from the opening of the, from the opening of the Hechal, then you have, in front of it, you have the Ulam. And that's, um, I believe that's five amount. You can check. Again, I apologize, I'm content, but I believe that's only, I think the width of the ulam is only five amount. Anyway, it goes 
from then the um, it goes out from the ulam, and then it comes to the opening of the azara. So that's the front of the ulam. Now you're at the beginning of the azara, and then it becomes kifi um, pach katan. It becomes like the spout of a small cruet, small pitcher. So it's getting increasingly wider as it comes out. As we learned that Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov says, uh, Water that's trickling in the future is going to come out from the threshold of the Beit HaMikdash. And the Fakim, as Rashi explains, kamin hapach, the, the, it's a verb form that comes from pach. So pach is a small pitcher. So water that comes out of a small pitcher would like to say trickle out. So it's kamin hapachin, kishimidiyin lemiftan ha'ichal. They're like water that's coming out of a small pitcher as it comes to the threshold of the ha'ichal. <coughs> Um, and then from there on, it gets greater and goes, you know, get, gets bigger and bigger. Until it gets to the opening of Beit David. We'll look at Rashi in a second. Once it goes to the to the opening of Beit David, then it becomes like a a, a, a rushing uh, uh, river or wadi. Shotef, uh, right? Like that, it's like uh, washing away everything in its in its path. Shiboroch tzin zavin v'zavot nidot v'yodot. That various People who need to tovel can wash in it, meaning that they can tovel, they would tovel in it. Shinamar, as it says, Bayamahu Yamakor Niftah Levet David, Uyashve Yushalain, Lechatat Ulanida. So we have a lot to try to unpack here. And again, I'll go through this best I can. And uh, we'll see what we get from it. Um, okay, so based on Yechezkel, we have the idea that there are four stages to the waters coming out. So now we have this Mamar. It's talking about Mayan Hayatsimi Beit Kodesh HaKadoshim and the, the, the um, proof text is based on the, the pasuk that he quotes at the end from, from Zechariah. It says, mm -hmm. On that day, a, um, a source will be open, meaning a, a source of water is going to be open. Levet David, to the house of David, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Lechatat, Ulanida. And we'll see how to understand the Chatat Ulanida. But there's a reference there. There's a couple of references in Zechariah to water. And this is the first reference. Okay, so he also describes that in the beginning, so it's, here's the thing. It's not exactly the way Yechezkel describes, right? Because Yechezkel says water comes out and it's supposed to start to come out, to come out from the south side uh, of the Beit HaMikdash. And then it gets measured for a thousand amot, and then it gets bigger, and another thousand gets bigger, another thousand gets bigger. And so here, the measures are different, and it seems the path is slightly different. So here, the water, you know, it could be the Yechezkel's water also starts from the Beit Kodesh Kodeshim, but it's not clear in the Tsukim that we saw that it's Dafka from the. Kodesh Kodeshim, 
but let's say it would make sense if it did. Uh, but here, so it starts off as a, a, a very fine trickle, right? Because it's only like the uh, an insect's antenna. But then it goes a little, and then it gets like a little bit thin, a little thicker, and then it goes like a little bit more, and it gets a little bit thicker. Um, until it get right until it gets to so what's petach beit david but once it gets to, we'll get to that in a second once it becomes petach beit david then it, it like explodes into this rushing river what what this idea has in common with Yechezkel and yeshayahu is one way or the other you end up with a body of water that's large and turbulent. That that's what they have. They all they have in common that they all start from the Beit Hamikdash. Water comes out of the Beit Hamikdash, and ultimately it's going to build up to um, uh, turbulent waters. With Yeshayahu, it doesn't say that it starts in the Beit Hamikdash. It just says that there's going to be these waters around Jerusalem. So you can understand, I mean, it's, it seems reasonable that we're trying to put these together, that um, we would like to think they're all related. They seem to be pointing in the same direction, that there's this idea that ultimately there's going to be this uh, huge body of water that, uh, that is quite turbulent. But the difference now is going to be um, so this is where Zavin Zavod Nidot and Yodot can travel. So of course that's very different than the way we understood Yeshua, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Very different. Um, but there's a reason that that. He says it because of the Pasuk in Zechariah. The Pasuk in Zechariah is by Yom Ahu. So we'll get to the Pasuk in Zechariah in a second. I just want to point out the Petach Beit David until it comes to the opening of the house of David. Uh, so it's not clear exactly what this is. Rashi says the Petach Beit David, um, there are actually two ways of reading Rashi. Uh, one of them is Kit Siyun Chut Siyushalayim. It's a Siyun, it would be like a grave marker outside of Jerusalem. That would be Petach Beit David. Or the other way to read it is it's Kit uh, Siyun. It's Siyun, which is outside of Jerusalem. That the term Siyon doesn't mean Jerusalem proper, but it means like right next to Jerusalem. Uh, again, I'm not sure, but I think I saw somebody who gave this, understood it the, the first way I said, so that's probably correct. And the way of saying Siyon instead of Siyun, that may just be my own misunderstanding. But it's not, but the idea, the, the idea of Beit David, um, what you know, it's not clear to me exactly what that means. Does that mean like Yer David, which is you know near the Beit Hamikdash, but it's not the Beit Hamikdash. It's not exactly the same. Again, I can't I can't say much more about it than than yeah. I don't know. But in the context, we understand that this is the water. Certainly, the way Rashi understands it's water once it leaves Yerushalayim proper is when it becomes this unruly body of water, which would be like uh, the understanding of the water that Yeshayahu is talking about, which is also surrounding Yerushalayim, and also most likely the way Yechezkel should be understood, because it's already, you know, it begins at 3,000 amot outside of, uh, the, outside of the temple. Oh, yeah. Right, the fourth, the fourth thousand is three thousand amot from the temple, so it will also be outside of Jerusalem. So again, it seems like they're all pointing to the same, to the same water. Now, why does he say that this is um, water that 
Zabin Zavod Nidot and Yodot Tavuin because of this Pasuk in uh, Zechariah. One second. Uh, Uh, so that's the beginning of uh, it's the very first pasuk in Parakid Gimel. By Yama who Yama Kor Niftach LeBeit David UliYoshvei Yerushalayim, the Chatat UliNida. So the word the Chatat uh, can mean for cleansing, right? Like Chitui. Rashi says Chatat UliNida UliAdyuta, which would which is this idea of cleansing. I will uh, leave, in other words, I'll leave behind their uh, their sins, basically, right? The, the, their sins, as if they were cleansed with this water of cleansing. Uh, uh, along with the um, the ash, <laughs> along with the ash of the para, right? So that's a, it's a bit of a drush, but the idea is that. Um, there's going to be this, but you know, this uh, well of water, this um, spring, this spring of water. Uh, maybe that's redundant. This spring is going to be open to Beit David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That's going to be for for cleansing, essentially. Um, yeah, here they say, in the, or you could say for sin and for sin and for impurity, right? So chatat would mean like for sin, uh, and nida would be refers to impurity, but you no. Know, so there are different ways of breaking it down. So if you take the English translation here, they that's how they understand that chatat and nida are synonym. They're synonyms that the water is going to be there for the impurity, for the sin, which is, in, which is like a spiritual impurity, and the nida, which would be like the tuma that would, you know, from like bodily tuma. Um, but the way the Gemara is darshaning, just a second. I always check, no, I try to check to make sure I'm on the right page. Um, so the way the, the way, right, the way the Joshua would be Pinchas goes, Shaborok Tzin Zavin Mizavod Nidot Viodo. So it seems like the way he understands Lechatat Ulunida, Lechatat would be like Fitui, like for cleansing, for the Nida. It's a little hard to read in the words because it says ulanida. It should have said lechatat linida, right? But he, it seems like this is the way he's understanding it. That this is what okay. So now, agav actually the nida doesn't have to uh, doesn't have to tavel in me maya. The zav does. Zav means me maya. That means mayim chayim. The nida doesn't, but I'm not, I'm not sure if that's entirely relevant. The point is that to bring it, you know, to get a, you know, a, maybe a larger perspective. So now we have, again, we have this other drasha from Zechariah that's talking, that we have a pasuk from Zechariah that's talking about water that is um, going to come out of Jerusalem somehow. So it doesn't give us a path like it does in Yechezkel, but it comes to Beit David. So the idea, the, again, the idea seems to be that we're going to identify this water as being like 
either the same or similar to the water of Yefezkel and Shegal. And this water will come ultimately for cleansing purposes, right? For some kind of Shitui or Tahara. So, okay, and so then the thing that strikes us is, but wait a second, the water of Yishayahu is uh, right, Lo Yavorbo right? You can't go through this water. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And here we're talking about people tumbling in it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not, it, 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 so is it the same? Is it different? What exactly are we talking about? Um, so let's go on a little bit for the Gemara. Amarav Yosef, Mikan Remez Lenida, Shetzucha Lesheva Tzavar Abamayim. So this is, right, this is a Remez, this is an allusion to the idea that Anida, when she tumbles, she has to sit up to her neck in water. Why does he say that? Because he's, it's talking about this water, and it says this water that's coming from, uh, that's Niptach Lebet David, it's going to be for a chatat for, for a nida. So a nida can tumble in this water, but based on what we know, in words, but if, assuming that this water is like the water is is the way that um, Rabbi Pinchas describes that in its in the final stage, it becomes a nachal shotef sheboroch tzin zavin v'zavod nidot v'yodot. So based on this idea that in its final stage, it's a nachal shotef. It's a flowing river that these people can tumble in. It's Rav Yosef says, ah, so it tells you that it must be that it's that um, when it that Anida must have to be in the, in such in, the, in this kind of water because the pasuk says l'chatatu Anida. So I just want to point before. Um, and then the Gemara says, "Well, let's talk about it." Right? Halach is not like Rabbi Yosef. Before we look at Rashi, <clears throat> I just want to point out again: it's interesting, Rabbi Yosef, who began this part of the Gemara by bringing the Psukim from the Peskil, is inclined to learn out uh, from these Psukim. Uh, Halachic imperatives. It's not. It's not immediately clear to us that this is the case, but when he quotes the psukim from Yefeskel, um, he says, "I see from these psukim in Yefeskel that one is never allowed to go through water above their waist, even though." I could read those psukim and say, it's not a halachic imperative that you're not allowed to do it. It just means that when Yechezkel had this vision, the vision that he had, where the water got above his waist, he wasn't able to pass through it. But as I said earlier in the shir today, that this idea of lo uchal or lo yaver, he understands those to be halachic imperatives that Yechezkel wasn't allowed to go through them, and it was a halachic imperative, not just for Yechezkel, but if Yosef says we can extrapolate from that for anybody, no one should be allowed to go through such water. But now we have this water, and here in Zechariah, the water says that, it, you know, it says Lenida, it's, it's for Lenida. So again, if you understand the water, to be the way Rabbi Pinchas describes, that it's a nachal shotef. So then Rabbi Yosef is saying, the way the water is described here is, you know, it's for Anida, and she has to be in water that where she sits down, it comes up to her neck. Which, in other words, what's the whole, just to understand the halachic implication. The question, right, so if we say that Anida has to toggle in She's toddling in a mikvah, 
the mikveh has to be 40 sa'a. But the shape of the mikveh is not prescribed by halakha. So you could have water that's just enough to cover the person when they're lying down. But as long as it's all together 40 sa'a, then it's a kosher tzvila. And Rav Yosef is saying, no, I see there's an illusion here that this water, which is supposed to be for a nida, and it's a nachal shotev, must mean that it has to come up to her neck. But the the whole thing is, again, it's very, it's, the whole thing is very difficult, because he says, shetzichat leshev at zavar that she has to sit it's enough that the, right, the water comes up to her neck. And where's the remez to that? Like, how does he know that she has to be sitting? How does he know that it's up to her neck? But what's interesting, of course, is now we're back to the neck, which was what yeah. Yosef, to begin with, had objected to. Yes. Right? You're not allowed to go through water that's up to your neck. And Abai says, oh, but that's in a, that's in, uh, that's in a nachal. And here, this is a nachal. Yes. <laughs> This is a nacha, so why, you know, but on the, so it's not clear how all these things add up, right? I, I, it's not clear to me. I, I really, I have not been able to put the whole thing together, but um, because it seems to me, as I said, that the, these different Nibiyim, Yechezkel, Yishaya, and Zephariah, who are all talking about water coming out of Yerushalayim, one might think that they're all talking about a similar vision, but actually, they're, each one is different. And so does that mean that that was each one had their understanding of this nivua, Or did each one have completely separate nivuot? And they're actually talking about three different instances of, of water. So we understand that the Gemara links Yeshaya to Luchezka, right? We saw that. That's the, that's, that's the way the Gemara understands. When we get to this drasha from Zechariah, it's not clear. It seems that it's brought here in light of the Psukim from Luchezka and Yeshaya, and so we would tend to think that it's describing a similar or the same vision, but the vision is different. So I don't know. I'm not a Navi. But, you know, there is this idea that Navim um, uh, various Navim could have could have had the same Navua, but the way they express it is pe peculiar to that Navi. So you see this throughout Navim, right? Because we have a lot of Navim who are talking about the impending destruction of the temple, for example. But they, they don't use identical language. They use very different language, and they use different metaphors, and they use different ways of, of describing it. And um, so you could say here also that Zechariah says, Pari is later, right? So Zechariah is at the beginning of Bayit Sheni. It has kills like in between. And Yeshayahu is, is uh, before the destruction and right you know, before and maybe right after the destruction, depending on how you understand Yeshayahu. So they're coming from different eras, but they're all talking about water coming out of Yeshayahu. And so we're also still left with what the point of the vision was. The most that I think that we've been, like the, the most explicit, I'd say, that we got was from Yishayel, that the point of having this water on Yishalayim was to be protective. But in the context of Yishayel, it was a metaphorical water that was being protective in that generation of Chizkiyel and his generation. And whereas Zechariah and Yechezkel both seem to be talking about yeah. Batid Lavo. There's yes. some kind of a, right, some kind of a final age or age of Gula. It says Bayomahu. So, yes. Yeah, it's Bayomahu. And actually, before we 
Uh, you know what? Let's look at Rashi. So Rashi says, Mikan, right? So this is Rabbi Yosef. Mikan Ren is Lenida. This is an allusion to Lenida. And Rashi explains, Midalo Krile Rauli Lenida, Ad Shemit Gaber Kanacho Shotev, Shemagil Le Petach Beit David. So Rashi is trying to understand how does Rabbi Yosef know that this water that it's talking about is water that she, that when Anita sits it would come up to her neck. So since it doesn't the pasuk doesn't say that the, this water that's coming out of the Beit Hamikdash would be proper for a nida, right, would fit the nida until it gets to the stage where it's a nachal shotef that comes to Petach Bet David. That tells me it's an allusion to the idea that In other words, the water, right, so uh, 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 Rabbi Pinchas, who starts this, who started the part of the Gemara with his drasha, he's saying that the water that Zechariah is describing is this water that comes out of the Kodesh Kodeshim that's very, that trickles out very thin, and then it's a little thicker, and then it's a little thicker, and then it's a Nacho So Rashi saying, the drasha is that Rabbi Yosef is saying that. The idea that it's lenida, that this water will be lenida, it it doesn't happen until it would get to the stage where it's a nachal shotef. That before that it would not be ra'ui lenida, as the nida comes only at the end of the pasuk after the makor is miftach, and it has reached petach beit david, right? Be'amahu uh, yamakor miftach levet david. In the context of what Rabbi Pinchas says. Um, he says, once the water reaches this place of Petach Beit David, that's where it becomes a Nachal Shotef. So Rav Yosef is just plugging that back into the Pasuk. So the Pasuk says there's going to be this, uh, this Makor of, of water, and it's going to be open and it will get to Petach Beit David. And once it's a petach beit david, it becomes a nachal shotef, and then it would be raui for a nida. So it's a remez, a ramaz, so it's, it, 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 it's an illusion, the idea that she needs to let mayim amukim, that she has to travel in deep waters until when she sits in it, that would come up to her neck. So it doesn't say that specifically, but Rashi is saying this is how Rav Yosef is understanding. Even though the pasuk doesn't tell us, right, it doesn't say explicitly, it does tell me that they're going to be deep waters, and so it would have to be of an acceptable depth, a pro, a depth, right, a, a proper depth, and that would be karau. That would be proper. So it's not Mufurash, but the idea is that Rav, Rav Yosef does, in fact, the halacha, want to say that when a nida goes to Tavl, that the water has to be in, in a shape that when she sits down, it will at least come up to her neck. But we don't ask in halacha like uh, like Rav Yosef. Okay. I think <laughs> um, I think we'll I think we're going to stop here with uh, with this. If I have more to add next week, I I will add. But um, we want to continue on in the Gemara, and uh, so I'll just read a little bit at the beginning. And this is where we're going to continue from next time. So now the Gemara is going to go back to our ongoing discussion. So remember, the ongoing discussion is uh, was about Rechitzah, right, on Yom Kippur. 
and we discussed that a lot, and under which circumstances are you allowed to wash or go through water, etc. Uh, but one of the things that we said, of course, is that one is allowed to walk through water on Yom Kippur, uh, provided that it's not above your neck, and provided that you don't lift up your garment to, as it were, carry your garment as you're going through. So now the Gemara says that it says in parentheses, Tenach Yom Kippurim Deleka Min Al, Man Al. Right. So this is okay. You could say this about Yom Kippur where you don't have a shoe. This is in parentheses because Rashi says that we're not go race that phrase. We'll talk about that next week, whether it's important or not. But the, but the Gemara goes on to say, Shabbat to Ika Manal Mai. But what about Shabbos when you are wearing shoes? In other words, what's the din about going through water on Shabbos when you're wearing <laughs> shoes? Because why? Because are we going to be worried that your shoe is going to come off when you're going through the water and then you, you'll then you'll want to carry your shoe so you don't lose your shoe and you're not allowed to carry, as we mentioned before, you're not allowed to carry in water. Alright, so then they're going to start to bring uh, proofs in discussion. And this is where we'll pick up next time. But I think that's a good place to stop. Okay. okay. All uh, right. Thanks. Uh, so Thank I will see you next week. I hope somebody yeah. comes next week. So we'll see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Listen, it's August. I understand. Yeah. It's, uh, it's okay. Fine. Take it. Take care. All right. Thank you very much. Good night. Okay. Good. Good afternoon. <laughs> yeah, and I'll send you Michael's contact information. Okay. Yes, please. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye. 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 -bye.